happy Sabbath. Uh, may you please stand for scripture reading? Our scripture reading will be taken from 1 John 2, verses 3 through 8, and you may read along if you like. Well, I'll read it since we probably all have different versions. Okay. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. And he saith, I know him. He hath saith, I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which he had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. Have a blessed Sabbath. Dear God, we do want you to speak to our hearts, but before we do that, we want to take these few moments and just allow you to grow big in our minds. The great God, the awesome God, the God of infinity, the God of infinite love and mercy and power and majesty. Why don't you just flood our minds now with a consciousness of you, who you are. We praise you for who you are. And we thank you for what you will do for us even now. Amen. Who said these words? I will build my church. Who said that? Pardon? You said that so quietly like it doesn't exist. Who said that? Jesus. Everybody say Jesus. What did he say? I will build my church. That's found in Matthew 16, verse 18. I will build my church. What church? Well, Jesus didn't say. He didn't give it a name. He just said, my church. So what does that tell you when Jesus says, my church? What does that, what does that tell you? Certainly it means him saying, the church belongs to me. Is that right? Certainly he means also, I own it, but I also grow it. And I direct it. Do you see that all in there? My church. And it's when human beings try to own it, try to grow it, try to direct it, that it's a mess. Jesus said it is my church, my church. So how many Christian churches, I mean denominations, not just congregations, how many Christian churches do you think there are in the world? In case you are running in the hundreds and in the low thousands, 41,000 Christian churches throughout the world. Do you think we have enough? That's a mess. And every one of them believes that they are right, and they all believe differently. There's something wrong with that picture, wouldn't you say? I hope by the end of this message I'm going to get a little more yes, no, amen, whatever. Okay. Something wrong with that picture, 41,000. Do you know which people group in the world are persecuted the most? The people group. Who are they? Christians. Now, it's absolutely true that non-Christians often persecute Christians in very, various parts of the world, but there is no one who has persecuted Christians more than fellow Christians. 
throughout the last 2,000 years. The hurt, the pain, the sorrow, the damage, the injury, the wounding among Christians is most often by fellow Christians. Something wrong with that picture, wouldn't you say? Something wrong with that picture. So with this fragmentation and with this persecution, isn't that very meaningful then that Jesus would say, I will build my church, and then he goes immediately on to say, and it will never perish. He put it differently. He said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Gates of hell is referring there to the devil, the demons, and all the attempts of evil to destroy the church. Jesus is saying, I will build my church, and it will not perish. In spite of all these other things, the fragmentation and the persecution. In the 1920s, there was created what was called the League of the Militant Godless. The League of the Militant Godless. Their intention was to wipe out everything to do with God from the Soviet Union, the USSR. Wipe out God entirely. In fact, in the 1929, their magazine had a picture on the cover of a man with a wheelbarrow, actually two of them on the wheelbarrow, carrying the wheelbarrow, and tipping Jesus out of the wheelbarrow. The leader of that league, a little while later, said he was most frustrated by the stubbornness of Christian faith. And here's what he said. Christianity is like a nail. The more you strike it, the deeper it goes. There's something good about that picture. Do you know how many Christians, I asked you how many Christian churches there were, how many Christians there are in the world? We said 41,000 denominations. 2.13 billion people are claimed to be Christians in the world. Do they all belong to what Jesus said, my church? I hope so. But I am most concerned that when it comes to being sure of belonging to that group that Jesus calls my church, I'm most concerned that I will be part of that group. And that my family will be part of that group. And that you are part of that group that Jesus says, my church. How can we be sure? How can we be sure? Especially because the picture of the church does not look that bright, does not look that popular, does not look that good. So that brings us to the passage that Brianna read for us earlier on. John is writing to the Christian church in about 90 AD, AD 90. And by that time, the Christian church was going through quite a change. This is a letter from a very troubled pastor. You can almost say John is anxious about the church. And the Holy Spirit has decided to give John that message so that we would benefit from what he wrote because in his foresight, the Holy Spirit knew that the same issues would exist today as they have for the past 2,000 years. So what happened then was many of the Christians were now second or third generation Christians. The excitement of discovering Jesus, which their parents had, which their grandparents had, had now faded. Christianity had now become more tradition. They got used to it. Christianity now became more left-brained, more to do with, that's what I know, intellectual knowledge, and more about being half-hearted 
instead of the enthusiasm that their parents had. That is what was descending upon the church. They lost the wonder of knowing Jesus. And John is concerned. And Jesus said it would be that way. In Matthew 24, verse 12, Jesus said, the love of many would grow, what word did he use? Cold. Jesus said it would happen. And yet John, in his lifetime, before he died, he notices that's what Jesus said. The church indeed is grown cold. The enthusiasm about Jesus is gone. You know, here's what happened. The people began to decide. They found that the demands of being a Christian were too difficult. Because when Jesus came and established his kingdom, being a Christian meant new moral purity than anything that was around in the Roman Empire, even within the Jewish community. It meant new sexual ethics. It meant a new way to love, a new way to forgive, a new way to accept others. It, knew, it meant new integrity. It meant new generosity. We're living all out for the kingdom of God, no matter the cost. That's what it meant to be a Christian. And that's what we see in the first century Christian church until yet towards the end of that century when John is writing, and now suddenly being a Christian became too difficult. Now, here's the first thing I want you to take to heart. If Jesus no longer is the thrill of your life, you will find following Jesus too difficult. I was hoping that you'd be silent after that statement. Let it sink in. Because I'm going to say it again. When Jesus is no longer the thrill of your life, then being a follower of Jesus will be too difficult, too demanding, high expectations. So in this early Christian church happening there around 90 AD, deception began to creep in. And the purpose of deception was not to destroy the, the church, but to reshape the church, not to destroy it. They decided to improve on the Christian faith. They decided to adapt to the times, to update the church, to incorporate the big ideas of, Greek, of, of, of the Greeks, of the Romans, of the culture into the church. So the church will become, become its own. It would take its place in the world alongside the great philosophies of the Greeks and of the Romans and of the Jews. They wanted the church to become strong, to become known, to become popular, to become liked. And Jesus was remodeled to fit in with this new version of the church. It was a new Jesus. Jesus was made to be like the church. Church became more about the church than about Christ. Do you get that? When the church becomes more about the church than it is about Christ, then what do you have? You have churchianity. I didn't coin that term. It's been around for many years. When the church becomes more about the church than about Christ, you have churchianity because Christ is taken out of Christianity, Christianity, he's taken out of that, it's replaced by church, now you have churchianity. Jesus has been remodeled, and John was troubled. So take your Bible now, go with me to 1 John chapter 1, and look at verse 1. Here's how John starts this letter to the Christian church. You have the background? Pretty similar today, and we need what John says, what the Spirit says to us. You ready with that? 
1 John 1 verse 1. He says, we proclaim to you the church, the Christian church. We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning. Who is that? Jesus. A little further on, he is the word of life. He is the one who is eternal life. A little while ago, I said to you, how can we be sure that we are part of that group that Jesus said is my church? I will build my church. How can I be sure I'm part of that? Well, you take these words to heart so that when you receive Jesus as the eternal one, but also as your eternal life, you receive Jesus as your eternal life. You then know you belong to that group that Jesus referred to as my church. That is the entrance. That is how he states it. He calls it my church, and it will show. It will show. And what John was concerned about here is it must show but it's not showing in that church because they have reshaped Jesus. They re reshaped the church into a different church. And so look at verse 6. 1 John 1 verse 6. He says, we are lying. We, the church, are lying. Strong words, isn't it? We who have, who have heard the proclamation of the one who is eternal, who is the word of life, he who is the eternal life, who we believe in, we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God. There's another way of saying I belong to the church that Jesus says is my church. We are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. John is really saying it straight here to the church. What is John saying? What is the Holy Spirit saying to us here? It seems to me that in this passage it tells us that to have fellowship with God and at the same time to go on living in spiritual darkness, don't go together. Is that true? Do you accept that? Is that true? Am I right on that? I mean, he's saying that here. Fellowship with God and living in spiritual darkness, just don't go together. Now, we can say that, but here's what John is saying. He is saying that, fellow, that there are, in fact, Christians in the church who are continuing to live in spiritual darkness. That's what's troubling him. And this happened gradually. This now started, this was becoming a real issue in that church, in the Christian church. He's not, the interesting thing is when you read this epistle, John does not address it to the church in Ephesus or the church in Rome or the church in Jerusalem or the church in Philippi. He just addresses it to all Christians. It's universal. And he is saying that there are Christians in the church who are living in spiritual darkness. What does that mean? Please get this understanding very clearly. To go on living in spiritual darkness is to knowingly and willingly and secretly to do the things that Jesus died to take off from our record and which Jesus died to take out of our lives so that we would no longer do those things that belong to spiritual darkness. Please understand, it is not talking about being perfect. It's talking about being authentic. It's not talking about people who are struggling with fear, with anxiety, maybe with depression. That's not going on and living in spiritual darkness. Those are issues that we do struggle with. But he's talking about the things that the world can see that they identify with as what the world does, the corrupt Rome, the corrupt society in which they are. And where people who do that and are in the church claiming to have fellowship with God, they're not authentic when they do that. That's what John is bothered by. 
You want to be sure that you belong to that group that Jesus says is my church. He says the way to do that is you receive the eternal one, the one who is your eternal life. When you've received that, you've got it, but it will show. And instead of it showing in the fruits of the Spirit, what showing is continuing on in spiritual darkness, something is wrong. Now, let me, let me say this. You and I will know if we are living in spiritual darkness. We'll know it. We may think no one else knows it. We know it. The light of Christ will have gone very dim in our lives. Christ would have been moved off-center because it's, he's replaced by something called spiritual darkness, something that fits into that category. It's taken center place in the life. May I ask you, are you living in spiritual darkness? Are you into something? Are you into something that you know belongs to spiritual darkness. And you will know. Now, please don't sit there and think, well, this pastor, he's really talking to me. What, what, what's he doing there? I want to tell you something. In every congregation, including this one, at any given time, there will be a number of people who claim to know God but are living in spiritual darkness at any given time. It was a concern in John's day. It was a concern ever since then. It's a concern today. And John was anxious about that. So the question is not, is he talking to me? No, he's talking about a condition that is real in every church all the time. Now, it may be you that's now in that position and you were not there a few weeks or a few months ago, but if you are there right now, can I ask you, are you slipping into that lifestyle because you're hurt? You're experiencing pain? You're wounded? You feel damaged, broken? Or maybe you're just careless and you know it. Does he know something? No, I don't know anything. God knows. That's what counts and what you know. That's what counts. And it's too crucial to just read these verses and not let it sink in. Let it confront me. It's too crucial. Are you in spiritual darkness? Are you slipping into that lifestyle because you're hurt? Something has happened in your life? Are you hiding it? Instead of opening up to God, opening up the heart to God and exposing it all to Him, that the light of His presence, remember, it is Christ the light of the world. It is Christ the light of the world that is the one that solves and absorbs and changes that kind of struggle. Open and opening to God or opening to somebody trustworthy whom God can use. Often he uses some instrument, some person, some person who's part of his church. He says, I will build my church. And in his church, he has people whom he places there who are trustworthy, to whom you can open up, who can point you to Christ. If this is describing you in some way, please don't feel judged. Please don't feel condemned. Feel loved. Feel loved by a God who is not going to allow the devil to have his way in your life unless he is going to beg, beg and plead for a chance. And he's more powerful than the devil. The devil wants you to feel judged and condemned. Don't feel that way. Choose to believe that you are loved, that Jesus wants to use your church family in spite of its faults. He wants to use your church family to give you hope. Please turn to the light. And every single Christian is faced at times with such tragedy in their lives where very easily they can slip into a deep pit of wrong. Very easily. 
It's not an exceptional thing. It happens to every Christian where devastation takes place. And that's when we're the most vulnerable. That's when the devil tries to pull us deeper and further away from our God. But Christians who land in that deep pit, they look up to the light because that light of Christ is shining on you right now. It's not a light of examination as much as it is a light of dispelling darkness. That light. So John is pleading with us. The Holy Spirit is pleading with us. Don't be in the place where you are lying, that you are knowing God, but that at the same time you are living in spiritual darkness. He puts it a little positively in another way. If you look again there at chapter Uh, what is this time, chapter 2, verse 6, he says, those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Now, we can't live our lives like Jesus did in the sense that we go onto the cross and die for the sins of the world. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the lifestyle of Jesus, the loving, compassionate, and obedient life of Jesus. Those who say they live in God, should live their lives as Jesus did. You see, Jesus, there's my next line I want you to take to heart. Jesus is not looking for admirers. He's looking for followers. So ask yourself the question, if I should spend one week with Jesus, how different would my life be? If I just devote my whole life, my mind, my actions, my time, everything about me, I'm going to devote it to being with Jesus for one week, how different would your life be? Because genuine Christianity shows up at home, behind closed doors. Christian, genuine Christianity shows up at home. And true believers conduct business with integrity. And those who know God make choices that can stand scrutiny, transparency. Those who know God will make choices that can stand scrutiny. Are you ready for another line? What was the last one? Jesus is not looking for admirers. He's looking for what? Followers. Here's one. When Christians act like Christ, then the church is Christian. And if it isn't, it's not Christianity, it's churchianity. So are you beginning to see there is a distinction? How would you identify churchianity? I'm going to give you three identifications here, and I hope they shock you, because they did me. It makes you rethink many things. It did that to me. Are you ready for that? Churchianity. Here's the first one. Any belief or practice that places larger emphasis on church culture, church tradition, any belief or any practice that places more emphasis on church culture, church tradition, rather than on Christ and his teachings, is churchianity, not Christianity. Got to think that through. To give you an example, I'll risk this and know that you're so loving, you wouldn't hold it against me. Question is this, how many people have been turned away from God, let alone turned away from the church, by someone who said to them, we don't dress like that here. We don't eat that here. We don't do that here. That is putting church culture, church tradition, higher than Christ. It's churchianity. Let me give you a second identity of churchianity. Churchianity is when people go to church merely 
to see their friends, not wrong to see your friends, but merely to see their friends and get a lift, kind of a boost, a pep pill for the week, merely that, instead of going to do three things, so all begin with an R to make it easy. Instead of going to church to reverently express adoration to God, you done that yet today? Consciously? Intentionally? And to go to church for a second reason, and that is to receive God's Word into the heart and life. Are you doing that? And the third R is to reach out and touch the life of someone else in need here today. The three R's, what are they? Reverently, actively expressing adoration to God. Receiving His Word into my heart and life and reaching out to touch someone else's life in need. If I go to church without that being the primary purpose, I'm into churchianity and not Christianity. Number three. Churchianity is strong on distinctive doctrines and is weak on demonstrating the actions and attitudes of Jesus in loving and being compassionate to other people. That's churchianity. Are we guilty? Now, here's the opposite. That the opposite extreme is just as bad. I've got to put this balance in here or else I'm in trouble with you. No, I'm not really saying that. The opposite extreme is when some want religion where Christ is all and church is nothing. Do you know somebody who has left the church in search of Jesus? Maybe you left the church at some point in search of Jesus and now you're back. And I'm thankful for that. It is true that many churches have invented a spirituality that has Jesus on the cover, but he's not in the book. Sometimes our churches are like pecan pies. I would always want to say pecan pies. That's where I come from. But you want to know what that means. So is it pecan? Is that right? If it is, say yes. Yes, okay, pecan pies. Sometimes the church is like Pecan pies without the pecans. We advertise Jesus, but he's not there. Serious, isn't it? So if the church is often a distraction from Jesus, then why have anything to do with the church at all? Why? Why not just dump the church? Everyone just do it their own way, in their own time, their own place. I'll tell you why. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is meant for people who are broken, who are hurt, who are sinful, who are rebellious, who are struggling with issues of darkness. The gospel of Jesus Christ is for people like that. Now, if the church is a gathering of people of brokenness, of rebellion, of struggling with spiritual darkness, people who are in in need of Christ, if the church is filled with people like that, then why leave the church and go and find Jesus elsewhere when Jesus is, in fact, in the church working with people who are broken and who need Him? Why leave the church for that? Suddenly, I want nothing to do with the church because it's so messed up. Well, who outside the church is not messed up? Tell me that. I'd rather be in a place where the dysfunctional people are where Jesus is concentrating his efforts of love and compassion than to be in a place where, yes, he is there, but he would never said, it is my church out there. My church. I own it. I direct it. I grow it. I heal it. I save it. See that? Why do we have this lofty ideal you know, as soon as somebody becomes a believer, they leave the will behind, they're now in the church, now suddenly we expect them to be so well behaved that as soon as they make a mistake, we say, 
and he is baptized. Wow, that should not be. Why are we like that? Expecting that only those in the church who are in the church are going to be all of them Christ-like all of the time? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Now, I'm not saying that we must be satisfied with a Christless church. I'm not saying that it's okay that we just let the church be as bad as it wants to be. No, no, no. But surely we should give the church the same amount of patience as we give ourselves. Makes no sense for broken people to leave churches that are full of broken people. Listen, friends, it is in the church of broken people that God works to heal broken people. And when we believe that, won't we be more accepting of one another? There wouldn't be one single word of gossip about the faults or failures of a single individual in the church by those who believe, that believe that God is in the broken church healing broken people. In fact, commitment to bear with the church's struggles is in fact the method by which we become more Jesus-shaped. He puts us here in the mess so that we can practice the grace that he has practiced to us. If you were put in a perfect church where you don't need to exercise grace, you won't learn to exercise grace. And on the journey to heaven, our greatest lesson is to be as gracious as our God is to us. Abandoning the defective church simply bypasses the cross because Jesus did not die for perfect people. So from our perspective, yes, we see the church isn't so pretty. We see the defects, the faults, the hurts, the divisions. Heaven sees that too. But listen, heaven sees more. You know what heaven sees when it looks at the church? Get this. Heaven looks at the church and the Heaven sees a cleansed and a spotless, perfect, holy group of people who are, what Jesus said, my church. That's what heaven sees. How do I know that? Heaven sees the bride wearing the spotless robe of Jesus Christ. That's what heaven sees. And here is how I can prove it. Ephesians 5, 27. Jesus died so that he could present the church to himself like a bride in all her beauty, pure and without fault. You say, that's only going to be true when Jesus comes again. It is true now in the eyes of Jesus. You are the church. You are that church. And heaven sees as wearing the spotless robe of Christ. What would that do to my attitude towards God, my attitude towards myself, towards my fellow church members when I see the church in that light? Jesus said, I will build my church. Let Jesus build you. Let Jesus own you grow you, direct you. You are His church. Nothing more precious to Him. Be done with darkness. Live as Jesus did. Be the church. I want you to listen to music that talks about beautiful Savior. What an appropriate way to ponder being the church of Christ. As we listen to words, listen to music that speaks about the beautiful Savior.